What? There is none, you say? Well then, let's check Google. Oh, wait, this chart looks good. Maybe I can make a video. Oh my. Now, Eastern philosophy is like the Game of Thrones of philosophy, but a little bit more confusing as it has several storylines taking place at the same time. Although, at least, Eastern philosophy doesn't have as bad of an ending. We've got this guy who kicked off things by writing the first Purana, which was a mixture of astrology, folk tales, medicine, love stories and good old humor. His son, next, was like, Dad, I'm going to be you, but stronger, and ended up just establishing the most important works and epics in Hindu tradition. Going a bit west, we come across Zarathustra. He put down the human condition as a struggle between Asa and Druj, or in your peasant language, commonly known as good and evil. He also wrote about human purpose and freedom of will to choose right and wrong. Anyways, enough about good and bad, because I have had enough of that. Now, going back to India, they established few orthodox Hindu philosophical schools which followed the ancient scripture. Vedanta chucked in the concept of human soul and supreme cause of the universe. Yes, yes, the universe, I know everyone loves themselves some good old creation of the universe. Well, yoga, yes, this is where your weird couple yoga positions come from. Well, not really, you guys are the ones who turned it into a horny zone. Well, these guys from yoga just like to chill, sit around and get psychedelic for some self-liberation. Oh yes, self-liberation. Well, Saramana was a heterodox school of thought. Yes, heterodox. Guys, time to pull out the pitchforks. Anyhow, this school included all other notable philosophies which you might have heard of. Ahem, <coughs> yeah. Now all out of sudden, we have got a lot of movement going on. I sometimes feel the world is like the person who gets sudden jolts of energy and motivation, but after the time passes, that person ends up burnt out and depressed. Okay, okay, right back to the show. Ajita Kesam Kambali was one of the first to introduce materialism in India. He denied the existence of an eternal soul and said, with that, everything is annihilated. Man, oh man, he really was something as he mixed amoralism, fatalism, materialism, eternalism and agnosticism to create the perfect philosophy for an edgy teenager you can find today. While Mahavira came in with Jainism, I mean he was important at all, encouraging non-violence, self-control and equal importance of everything, but man, they were ahead of us one step. At the same time, Buddha vowed to starve till death. I mean we all know this guy and unironically use his teachings. Um, okay. He taught the four noble truths. The first truth explains the characteristic of human suffering and how we can avoid it. The second truth is about human aversion and craving and tells us a way to modify our wants. The third truth is about to stop chasing that girl who you stalk online because you should give up that useless craving and reduce suffering to become happy. Also, she was not in your league anyways. Um, <clears throat> yes. The fourth truth is about the noble eightfold paths which assist to end the suffering. And now we finally make our way into the east. Ah yes. Ancient China. Nope, not yet. We have got a particular segment for the land of the rising sun. Shintoism, or Kami no Michi, originated from Japan. I swear I didn't want to say it in Japanese just because I'm a weeb or something. Anyhow, Shintoism revolves around gods or spirits inhabiting everything in the world. So basically being a pantheistic philosophy. Now because everything has a spirit doesn't mean you could go on humping your body pillow because you think it is alive or something. Ah yes. We skip over China now and go back to India. Psych! We are chilling with Confucius. Two significant parts of Confucian ethics are Li and Ji. Li is based on the actions required by the person to create an ideal society, while Ji is based on actions which are ethically best in context. There is also Ren, which is based on actions of benevolence and virtue toward others. In the same era, we've got the school of naturalists where Zhao Zhan contributed to this philosophy. He used the duality of yin yang and five elements to explain the workings of the universe. Ah yes, of course, those five elements were taken from Naruto as it was made before the school of naturalists. Connecting the dots was Lao Tzu, who created the philosophy of Daism. He wrote about the concept of Wu Wei which emphasizes that virtual lies in non-action. The life is needed to be lived effortlessly, like a stream of water which moves freely and without any resistance. I really like this philosophy because I like to live effortlessly on my parents' income. Ah, I love to be loved. Arrival of Confucian philosophy was Mao Tse. His philosophy was basically love everyone mate, everyone. 
Even that person who parked the car in your usual parking place. God damn it, Eric, I can't hit you anymore. The last famous ancient Chinese philosopher was Shan Yan, who was a philosopher representative of legalism. His authoritative work showed that he was a strict applier of publicized laws imposed from above as human nature was thought as selfish and short-sighted. Oh, you thought? I forgot about Sun Tzu. Well, yes I did. He came and took a different direction than most philosophers. He wrote The Art of War which discussed the strategies and philosophy of war, including use of deceit, delaying action if necessary, willingness for creating alliance and use of spies, people playing among us. Take notes please. Mahavira found the Samkhya school who argued the universe was made of two realities, Prakti which means matter and Purusa which means consciousness. Chanakya who was I would also say was ahead of his time as he set down the monetary and physical policies which my friend are economics terms and I have to go through them every day. Yes, yes, my life is very enjoyable. Thank you, thank you. <sighs> Chaimini established Mimasa, which was more about the philosophy of language and philology. Sage Kanata created the Atomist school of... Okay, I realize there are a lot of school of thoughts in India and the names are seemingly becoming difficult. So, we instead go to the Iranian philosophy. Oh yes, Mani, who established Manichism, which in simple words was Light spiritual, light good. Light comes, light goes. Becomes dark dark evil, dark materialistic. Yeah, yeah, you can see I've given up on explanation now. While moving even more to the west, Islam was spreading pretty quick because they were conquering whatever they laid their eyes on. There were few school of thoughts formed over the interpretation of the Quran and conflicts over who to follow after passing away of Muhammad. The Sunnis followed Abu Bakr, the Shayas followed Ali, and the Sufis followed Ali as well. I don't know man, Sufis are pretty much about higher spirituality and closeness to God. And to be honest, that whirling is lit fam. Most of the philosophers after this time period dwelt on the previous ideas such as in India, heterodox and orthodox schools are followed. In China, Confucianism, Taoism, Legalism and Buddhism battled it out. While due to Muslims from Arabia conquering Persia led to an increase in Islamic influence on the western side. Well, there are still few outliers as Avicenna wrote 400 freaking books. I can I barely write one script for a YouTube video and he wrote 400 books on logic, ethics, metaphysics, medicine and commentaries on Aristotle. In the end, he did become a big fan of Plato as he ended up mixing Neoplatonism with theological discourse. While 200 years later, Averroes was a strong proponent of Aristotle's philosophy. He also wrote books, but this time only 100. Yeah, rookie numbers. Need to up your game, mate. Although he did end up criticizing Avicenna's theory of emanation and many other ideas because he was a hardcore Aristotle supporter. Well, seems like a good old rivalry. But shame, Avicenna was dead at that time, so maybe by default Averroes wins. From 13th century to 20th century, Eastern philosophies kind of remained constant with Sikhism under Guru Nanak coming into existence, while transcendent theosophy mixed notion of existence precedes essence with Islamic theology under Mullah Sadra. While from the 18th century onwards, Western influence increased because imperialism, yay! When people felt like they needed a change or felt like mixing two philosophies up, they would put new or new in front of the ancient philosophy's name in order to make people believe, hey, this is a totally new philosophy and much better than that old one. It is just like Apple trying to sell their iPhones by just changing the number of the model. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Hmm. Okay, I can't remember. Oh well. Eastern philosophy, although not as prevalent as its counterpart which being Western philosophy, still has played an enormous role in billions of people's lives. It's not only shaped the lives of the East, but in the West also influenced the philosophy. Arthur Schopenhauer was enlightened by Hindu scriptures which were of course written by Vyasa. Heidegger also turned to the East as his works had a similar character to the works done by Kyoto School of Philosophy, meaning he also secretly wanted to join the Weep Squad. Also, people such as Alan Watts brought more attention to the concepts of Buddhism, Taoism and Hinduism to the western world through his lectures, books and interpretations. Man, if we was alive, I would be so down to do some aesthetical experimentation on lysergic acid ditalamide or LSD in short. Currently, due to mass information exchange, globalization and internet, Eastern philosophy has penetrated west even more. But still, the Eastern philosophies are prevalent in the areas which they originated from originally due to their inherent linkage with culture and theology. 
but I hope Eastern Floss Weekend rise even more, as it is a treat to get to know more about it. The intuitive nature of Eastern philosophy tries to dwell on the spirituality side of things, plus the simplicity of our being, instead of trying to find the logic and the ends behind everything. But again, without the combination of both Western and Eastern philosophies, the spectrum of philosophy cannot be completed. It is like a dialectical approach to living in this world, where sometimes you have to create a sense of harmony and contentment with this existence, while on other times you have to engage in the activity of finding meaning and ideas of this existence. In the end, I have only one thing to say, and only one, that the best source of learning Eastern philosophy is... Yeah.